recording. So welcome to the September 5th meeting of the OSE developer team. We're going to go through the agenda here, just a couple of um uh, yeah, a couple of introductions. Oh, where's my camera here? Oops, it's facing down. So I'm right here. And we've got a few people online here, so that's good. So uh, the agenda for today is in our regular working document. So let's uh, go to that document. Let me paste the link in the chat. And for the new people, we, we typically have uh, on the developer log page. That's where we keep track of all the agenda. So development team log, that's where it's at. Uh, actually, let me let me share my screen. And what I do typically is uh, just like right now, a couple of people posted their updates in the uh, in the working doc. But if you go to the development team log, you will click on the current date, and you see the current work document. So what I try to do after right after every meeting is set up the next one, which would be then for Tuesday, September 12, so that people can paste their results in there. So it's a collaborative document. Uh, so to begin with. First of all, welcome to our new member. So, so Stephen has just joined the team. He's here with us. That's excellent. And um, we actually talked briefly, but Stephen is interested in. He went to. He attended one of the three D printer workshops, and he's interested in potential replication in the San Francisco Bay Area. So, we're going to have him uh, collaborate on the three D printer part of the work, which is quite exciting because we're actually pretty much ready with all the parts that we have already to do the the workbench within FreeCAD. We've talked about that before quite a bit, but we have all the um, all the parts and just like there's for example the fasteners workbench or other workbenches where you drag and drop parts to make a complete design, that's what we can do. We can have pretty much drag and drop parts of D3D into the the FreeCAD window, so a dedicated D3D, so 3D printer com design workbench within FreeCAD, which will allow many more people to design. An important part about that is that you can spend a lot of time just messing around with a physical build, or you can design in virtual in the FreeCAD, where you figure out okay, where are the what are the exact boundaries of the of motion. The, the most important thing you can figure out from CAD is okay, what's what's the resulting bed area going to be so we can optimize that and make sure things don't hit against one another. So it's definitely a time saver and will be excellent for doc future documentation modifications. So we, I mean, we are planning on doing bigger 3D printers and then other other machines using the same construction set. Like, like I want to get to a two by two foot printer where we can actually do things like print rubber tracks. And that's not far out. I'm actually talking to the people in Germany, our collaborators at Helmut Schmidt University, if we can actually, if they could actually help us print, they've got a big rep there, and I'm gonna see if I could get them to help out and print the rubber tracks for the tra micro track that we're building, the micro tractor. Um, it would take about, I did some calculations. It would probably be about uh, six pounds or eight pounds of rubber per track for a very small track, just an initial prototype, six inches wide, uh, about six five feet long, basically to to do the kind of track that we've been doing uh, before. But that, that would be pretty exciting to show that you can actually 3D print rubber tracks out of thermoplastic urethane. That would be pretty amazing. So that's the brief on the tractor construction set, uh, tractor construction set on the, on the 3D printer workbench for FreeCAD. So we're going to get Steven working on that. And um, let's move on here. So welcome Steven and, and we'll talk about that um, we'll set up a meeting as soon as we can on that. Uh, Steven, by the way, are you, would you be available? Yeah, I mean, you are available. Oh, let's see. Well, I wanted to ask you if you're available like this evening to talk about that by any chance. Are you guys unable to hear? Uh, Steven, okay, Steven might have popped out, maybe some internet issues there. Okay, but continuing. So, um, first thing is, uh, so the OSC Linux, that's the second item on agenda here, um, OSC Linux testing, audio, audio issues, okay, uh, let's delete that, okay, so yeah, maybe fix that, um, and here's the pasting of the current numbers, so by the way, uh, we've got 
on time logging we've got the new system on each one of your logs is a new time logging system which is automated and thank you to Lex for doing this but we now have an automated way to track all the time so this is getting generated automatically including we can generate all the individual time times for each person's contribution uh, for example so that's that's on a it's called osedev.org is the actual website you can see that there uh, and that's there's that's documented there but you can you can see the overall you can see the individual breakdown by the people uh, you can click on people to erase um, you know, like a manual here so here's like all the different people's contributions in terms of time uh, you can do a single person's time and uh, you can embed that all within the timesheets and you can also select the date range and the size of these embeds so this is freely embeddable within the wiki these are just HTML iframes that are embedded in the wiki generated automatically and then the, there's an automatic data dump there uh, we can just simply uh, click on everybody.csv to export this data set so we can graph it elsewhere so it's fully portable data but yeah please use that on your log as as far as time keeping goes uh, that facilitates it uh, makes it easier so right now I can just copy and paste this instead of having to generate the the summation from an individual uh, spreadsheet the Google spreadsheet that we were using before so this is great um, and let's keep going on that uh, Linux testing so so Christian has done the OSC Linux you go to the OSC Linux page you can download Linux the OSC Linux but the important thing there is for everyone to test it so I downloaded it and it works great just download it put on a USB stick I'm using startup disk creator in an hour you create your bootable USB you turn off your computer start the computer and it automatically boots from the USB if you have the USB inserted or at least it automatically does that on my Dell Precision M6500 laptop I don't even have to hit the special boot menu it boots right up from the USB and it's fast and it's good and right now we're um, adding some more software to it like we have FreeCAD of course there with some of the workbenches additional workbenches we're updating that but the first thing is please uh, download it and test it that's what the second page on this second page here is supposed to be um, so uh, for everybody please download and test it I mean we want to make sure that this works like for example for 3d printer workshops you can just download this and use Cura, Cura and the 3d printer control software right off the USB no problem because I know so far at every workshop nobody had the software pre-installed uh, you know I emailed people the you know download the software but nobody did that beforehand and so forth so uh, that will facilitate some things during workshops and everywhere in development where we have the same software like for example if we could get uh, I know Ex Explode Part animations were crashing on my computer all the time maybe with this OSC ISO with the OSC Linux uh, we make sure that it, it's stable and it works so that everybody has access to working software that it works simply works for everybody so that's the Linux part okay let's go right back into uh, so there's please uh, put questions and comments in the questions and comments uh, slide number three okay let's look uh, at the product reviews just, yeah go ahead uh, just, just, just ask yeah um, I, I'm glad it's working however uh, you're not the, not the only one uh, reporting network, network errors and I just want to ask uh, maybe how this spreads itself because I'm not quite sure what it is because on my side it's working fine on your and, side the uh, the the wireless is working fine yeah yeah that's, interesting that's the point so, yeah so uh, how exactly does this look so um, what I mean I'm doing and what is it working right so when I open up there's the there's the Ethernet network simply there's no no bars and no networks visible when you turn on I enable Wi-Fi and simply no networks are, are visible so I can't click on anyone that's just what happens and I know that's not I, that's a bug somewhere we gotta track that down because I know that this happened when I install Linux normally that's not a problem so there's something that we need to track down there uh, maybe see if okay, you can so, look into that yeah, this, this is probably a driver issue I'm not quite sure but yeah. uh, I may look into it uh, maybe you give me the uh, the how, what what version of precision you're using so maybe there's some kind of forum that's uh, what version that's of precision already... um, 
Hey. Yeah, the hardware. Oh, oh, Dell Precision M6500. Yeah, M6500, that's in a. Right? Oh. So, by the way, if you go to the OSE Linux page, we're documenting that. So, yeah, just to follow up on that, there's a spreadsheet on the OSE Linux page where we're recording all of that. So, if you see that spreadsheet, I've got myself there. I, I've got that developer Marchin. I do have that hardware tested Dell Precision. So, you can actually. Please record all that information in that spreadsheet. Um, yeah, okay. That's, so that's, that should be right there. It's uh, it's right there. So just maybe just uh, you know put the next developer, next developer below that, and see that. And here in, in this column, I'm testing all the ones that, like which ones have been installed and tested. And we can also make comments. Like for example, if you know if the exploded part animations are crashing on us, make a note of that or something and stuff like that so please use this uh, spreadsheet to put your comments as far as the system you, you you're using and whether it's working for you okay thanks Christian so yeah just continue on that and see if uh, we can track that down and it, it, it'll be interesting to see that it's totally hardware independent I mean that's that would be the goal because it's running off the USB it's you know but of course that won't happen but so let's see how how much we can solve on that, if there's a yeah, universal uh, solution, I'm not not quite sure, but uh, yeah, it's, it's basically it's not possible because there are so many uh, versions out there. But as far as I know, especially Ubuntu is pretty heavy uh, on on that, so there are many drivers on it. So it, there may be some weaknesses on the graphic cards because uh -huh. there's a graphic card. So yeah, nothing, um, and but, I'm also uh, actually I'm pretty pretty surprised that it doesn't work because yeah. I never had any issue. Because, right. Uh, Wi-Fi cards. It looks like so, Abe is yeah. Abe is saying that the wired network doesn't work either. Is that so there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That that's that's exactly what, what I wanted to ask. Maybe maybe Abe had something to say on that too. Yeah. But maybe it's just the same issue. So. Yeah, and please, um, yeah, please post the results. I'm gonna just make a note there. Please post on the OSE Linux page. Please post results. Post details on OSE Linux wiki page. Okay, so moving right along, let's go right into the core of the work. So right now we're focusing on the tractor for the build that's happening October 27th through the 29th. So we're getting pretty excited about it. I'm gonna see if I could get the rubber tracks. So these triangular tracks that we're making, we can make a small version with 10 inch idlers where the each individual track would be about five feet long so we can actually 3D print it. And on what you see right here, that's just the frame with the power cube placeholder. The frame here needs to be narrowed down to 20 inches. It's 24 inches right now. We see the motor mount plates, the, the idler mounts. Uh, I believe that Will, let's see, Will Log, I think he, I believe he's done the uh, <clears throat> updated just with, I think, the idlers here. <laughs> so let's uh, take a look at that. But the idea is that I've allocated different roles to different people. On the, I sent some emails out to people, and we're keeping the master master tracking of that on the Life Track Construction Set 2017 page. Uh, so, so Life Track Construction Set 2017 page. So this page now is fully seeded with task allocation. So there's a scrummy up on top. And I asked Joseph to maintain that to up, update people's tasks. Uh, so that's Scrummy right there with all the different different tasks. And the way it works, we tried Scrummy before, but we kind of dropped it. But let's try it again because it is convenient that you can just put and put new... new. These are like post-it notes and you can shift them from one column to the next from to do, which means request of assignment to in progress where it's actually started to the verify where if you've done it then whoever's uh, an expert in that task can verify it whether it's myself or someone else and then done when it's completed so it, it is convenient and we're adding people on the left column uh, people are the left column so the stories are people here uh, all of us and so forth so so use it please use it um we're going to try to keep tracks track of tasks so that we don't have to do a new slide every work meeting 
it is more convenient, but we do have to pay attention to it. So please either manage yourself on this when you have completed tasks or Joseph should be uh, overlooking that. So uh, the MicroTrack concept document is here on the same page. The MasterCAD checklist, that is the main document we're working with. So basically each single part of the tractor is in here with names allocated to it. A lot of the this in the back is the power cube parts. We're trying to fill that all in. Af so after the MasterCAD checklist is the part library. So there's a list there, there uh, just a list here, but uh, there's another part library page I'll show you. But there's a development template page on the same page. So we're actually trying to do proper record keeping of all the different assets for the tractor from requirements in graphic concept, module breakdown, interface design, 3D CAD, BOMs, build instructions, etc. Uh, that's all to be filled out. And I've requested that Lex generate a burn down graph for us so that we can see this as a burn down, which is the percent completed over time. So that is good. And then below this, you have all the previous uh, presentations on the tractor. And let's go to the original part library page, which is just called part library. And that's where actually um, a lot of the parts for the tractor reside. So it's got everything here. But here you can see the visual representation of all these different things, like the motor, the either mount plates, etc. Sprocket, tracks, uh, a lot of different parts, idlers, micro track from before, and so forth. So that's the OC part library. And as far as looking at this, take a look at that. All right, so we've got uh, the idlers on. Uh, next we need, so this is by Will, he just added the, the idlers. And the way it's working, uh, so these actually should be long shafts because it, it should be just one shaft. So you're supporting the shaft with these two plates. And these shafts do not spin. The bearings make the idlers spin. And next the tracks go on the idlers and the motors go inside these. Uh, so the main thing is the hydraulic motors go here. The hydraulic motors get the get the sprocket. This this sprocket here. This is what drives the tracks. Uh, so this is attached to the. If you look at the file for the motor itself, the motor is actually updated to its. Uh, if we. I'll open up the motor. But the sprocket mounts directly on the hub of the motor using bolts. It's got a five bolt pattern. So the next is, um, yeah, that the motors need to go in here. The motors get their hydraulic fittings. So that's how the motor looks. That's an approximation. This motor is not exact, but it's, let me sh see if I'm sharing my screen. Yes, I am. It's not exact, but it's this is the plate where the sprocket actually mounts right on this, and it's got five bolts on this plate here. This is a good representation. The length and width are pretty much approximately good. And the mounting plate for this motor would go right here on this surface. That's where the mounting plate goes. Here it has that mounting plate right here, but no, it's, it's actually right here. So we can draw this, this surface in green. That goes right against where's my where did my tractor disappear to okay I lost my tractor I'll try to open it up again yeah so here in the tractor, the motors fit right onto that plate. The four bolts go on this plate. It's going to be one, two, three, four bolts mounting the motor. The motor has the sprocket. Upon the sprocket go the tra tracks. You could look at the former documents for how the tracks look. And we can use the identical tracks. If we close up the distance between these idlers, then you can have a tiny track. And that's what we're going to do for the rubber. So we can do a rubber track, and that's that's for proof of concept that you can 3D print tracks, and that's pretty insane stuff if we can do that. Um, six pounds of print that would take 
a few days but if you have a huge nozzle like we're trying to move to the larger nozzles we're only at 0.5 nozzles but we want to do the 1.4 millimeter nozzle where we're just spitting that rubber out like crazy and I looked at uh, pricing of rubber I think we can get uh, I mean from China we can get like eight dollars per kilogram for thermoplastic urethane which is rubber it's a durable rubber it's used in trucks and uh, that's what we want to do so next steps here are to mount the power cube into its proper place maybe uh, Roberto you can do that uh, do the loader arm so I've assigned that to Josh so basically create a geometry of loader arms based on the uh, kind of like the Tordingo so the the mount point would be that hole right there perhaps so we'd probably do some kind of a uh, typically what we do for mounting loader arms is either three inch or two inch shaft so basically take out a hole make a hole in this larger hole put in a large shaft and the shaft once again goes all the way through symmetry is a good design concept so you want to send send the shaft all the way through just like on the bottom here this shaft should be all the way all the way through this is not going to hold these just are going to wobble um, so the shaft needs to go all the way through to the other side there's going to be clamps so clamps so that this this shaft doesn't move back and forth up and down here we're going to have clamps underneath there's a half inch space underneath there but we need to insert clamps which look like if we go to the part library the clamps look like um, like this thing this thing is not drawn completely but this would have the two bolts one on each side and you can look at I believe the last work document where we showed a real picture of those clamps that was I believe in um, the last working document which was uh, it's at the top here the last work document from the design sprint is up here uh, so here's how the tracks are gonna look idler idler frame etc uh, that's the motor detail one good thing to do would be for somebody to do the motor detail and for that we want to go to let's let's go actually to the uh, to the master checklist so I'm gonna click on that going back to this document here I'm gonna open up the the microtrack 1710 document Uh, but as far as uh, the allocation of parts, can anyone comment on the different parts that have been assigned Because uh, and if things are clear? So basically what we want to do is put in the bolts, like for the idlers, there's bolts, there's the motors, um, motor mounting bolts, and then there's the... One is the motor attaching to the mount plate, and the second part is the motor mount plate attaching to the frame. So there's two sets of bolts there. There's quick couplers, sprocket, uh, details, details. Uh, clamps. We don't have a tensioning mechanism on this, so we need to design a tensioning mechanism, which we're not there yet. Uh, and then the power cube. Roberto has been doing a lot of work on putting that together. So if we go to the next in the design dock... Uh, here's the current state of the power cube. So that's what we have 20 inches wide. Uh, so this is a good representation of the current one. And I'm going to open up the real, real one. So Roberto Log, let's download it from Roberto Log so we can take a look at that. Maybe you can do that as well. But going to Roberto Log, I will download the, the link piece. Is in the the team document. Ah yes, so that's good. Downloading that. Opening it up. That's looking good. Um, 
with this version of the power cube we want to continue further and the one task on that is to allow for four exits of the hydraulic tank uh, in the present power cube we have one exit so as you see here so that's the actual so the hose the suction hose on the on a pump goes to this one suction but we want to have four of these since we're going to suckle four engines from the same tank so that's what we want to do in the next of uh, the version where we make a power cube that can be used and uh, multiplied up to four power cubes because we want to build a 64 horsepower tractor in that case we're going to enlarge this cooler so they have coolers that are bigger than this and what we will do is I, I think they will actually fit in the same space so we can uh, replace this smaller cooler which is enough for one engine plenty for one engine we can double it or more so that we can cool the power cube the idea is that the hydraulics they waste about 15 percent of power as heat that heat needs to be dissipated so that the hydraulic fluid does not get too hot not above 180 Fahrenheit is the idea there but yeah this is good uh, that's what we need and the geometry turns out to be quite acceptable here uh, for everything and let's see what's the dimension the final dimension that we got on here do we get it down to uh, 30 or are we longer than that yeah 30 30 by 20. Right. And in your picture, actually, there's actually, so that's 30 inches there. How come the pump is so far, there's still a good space there? How are we getting that? Because in reality, when we were 33 for the power cube, we had about 3 inches back there. So something is not, maybe the engine is too thin here. Um, we can verify that, but I can tell you in the real build, if you were to the real build has a 30 and 33 33 inch frame and the pump is like similar to what you show here so after it's 30 that pump should kind of move back towards there so this implies that we might have the engine or the pump mount here not long enough because yeah this will move back a little bit I think probably the coupler here is probably a little longer or the engine is slightly thin um, let's see who's doing the engine. Josh was doing an engine. Josh, have you updated the engine for the th thicknesses we we have uh, claimed in the uh, last documentation, like in the pictures? Uh, not not yet. So okay. it's probably the engine. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So the engine probably needs to get fatter by like three inches, and then this cool. pump would move back, like to literally within a half an inch to an inch of this back tank, and then. Okay one outstanding task is also to draw up the pump coupler which is in all the documents there uh, this is the cu coupler it's actually um it's not one of these couplers it's the lovejoy like that spider coupler and then we still need the mount the mount that mounts to the engine plate and to the flange of the hydraulic pump so that mount is not shown here which needs to be added still uh, pump mount so we should uh make that explicit in the master CAD checklist let's see do we have that pump mount um, if not we want to add that somewhere here there's the pump yeah there's not an explicit placeholder for the pump mount so I'm gonna insert a row there so that would be the pump mount bracket and then we should probably do uh, an explicit item for the spider coupler so spider coupler it's the one you see if you click on the link there you'll see the specs for, for the spider coupler and the pump mount bracket those things need to be added who could we add to that? Josh, you want to, can you get on that as well? Pump mount bracket, can I put your name there? Uh, sure, yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay, so an update on the, on the engine. 
as well as the other other two items. Um, oh yeah, but you're already uh, we already got you assigned for the loader arms. Yeah, so that's that's plenty. Uh, but we didn't put the loader arms into this main main thing here. So let's put this uh, item number 24 here would be the loader arms. So just working out that geometry there. And right before the loader arms, one easy thing to do about the loader arms is one, first in insert the three inch shaft. Um, Ah, not not three inch. Let's do the. No, we can do. I think three inches okay. No, three inches is really heavy. Let's do two inch shaft there, for the loader arms. But if we want to make those loader arms scalable, we would want to use three inch. So let's just go. Let's just go all the way out. Just go, go with the super heavy three inch shafts for the loader arms, which is a shaft that's gonna go. So in our CAD, what that would mean is that a shaft just goes right through that just the same as these these wheel shafts this very heavy shaft goes right through that space where the top hole is and upon that on the outside we can mount the loader arms so it's a very heavy attachment for the loader arms and then outside of that what we want to do is clamp it down so if we go to um let's see i wanted to see in a in a work document from last time uh, we're talking about this these are super heavy duty clamps so that is a three inch clamp it bolts together and it can hold things like the loader arms on or it can hold the idler shafts so that there is no axial motion we want to prevent axial motion meaning the shaft doesn't slip out of the the hole doesn't move back and forth so that's what we've got uh, we can make these with a little shorter like maybe you can get them down as short as just a one bolt clamp which would probably be useful for the loader arms where you don't want the loader arms to be sticking out too far outside of the body of the tractor so when we mount the loader arms maybe we use like a like a single clamp which means that uh, it just takes less space on the shaft so the shaft can be shorter so what we probably want to do is draw this yeah one thing that's not finished in the whole template is we should do like a one bolt clamp so let's let's put that in here insert row above so one bolt clamp uh three bolt clamp so basically the same construction except just shorter with one bolt hole versus two bolt ho holes versus three. So two bolt clamp, who wants to take that? Uh, but the model is, is here, it's a three inch tubing, it's called drawn over mandrel tubing, it's a seamless precision tubing that we can get and I'm actually going to get a whole order of that because this, this three inch tubing is what's going to couple, like for example if we, if we torch the hole out in the arms you want to put in that tubing as a as a guide around that so that uh, it's held accurately so the loader shaft is held accurately in place and in here what we can do because that tubing is actually now four inches that would cut the whole tube away so what we can do is notch out a semicircle on top and just weld the tubing right in there and that would be a solution for how to mount the shaft so does that make sense weld this tubing so so maybe maybe let's break that down into the two tasks one would be the tubing and shaft for the loader arms and then the second part is the actual geometry of the loaders themselves which we can't use this tubing we want to do a precise geometry because there here the geometry matters or otherwise you'll end up like Life track six, the geometry of the the loader arms is kind of awkward because there the pre precise, like the inches matter, like uh, the bulk, just crude four inch tubes, they just don't work well because you'd have to cut them at specific angles. So you might as well cut out from say half inch plate, cut out the loader arms as needed. 
uh, for the more precise geometry. If you look at what the Toro Dingo does, if we expand that, theirs is what looks like just flat plate, and that looks like prob I don't know what what thickness it is for us. Half inch would be relevant. Half inch with probably some reinforcement. We'll have to see exactly how it looks, but uh, half inch might be doable. Uh, that's that's a little light. It would have to be reinforced. It would have to be bound together, like on the inside, so it doesn't wobble back and forth. Um, but at best, you probably want something like one inch plate for the loader arms. So that would be pretty good. Uh, we probably might want to go just right to one inch because that's going to be much much stiffer than half inch, and we can easily cut. Ha uh, both half inch and one inch uh, with CNC cutting we aim to have our torch table up and running so uh, just to go into this this thing so let's let's just specify these parts just more explicitly so we've got the three bolt clamp we've got row above row below the loader arm so so below the lo loader arms we have the loader arm bushing which is basically the three inch tubing that's welded welded to arms and we're gonna clamp it and we're gonna put a shaft in there so so that's that's how it looks here uh, for the shaft I'm gonna just insert that picture in there for people's reference so I'm just going to put a link to that uh, for the three bolt clamp. I'm just inserting that hyperlink. So you have it right there. There we go. So that's, um, let's see, so there's some more tasks. Is anyone on the team here um, looking for some tasks to be assigned otherwise I'm gonna assign people and let me know if uh, anybody scream if the, the assignments here don't work for you um, so that's the current spreadsheet let's see can we put any people by these other parts like maybe Abe Abe I think you can knock out the who wants to take them maybe Abe Yeah, I Abe, right there. Screen at the moment, but I'll okay. Find it. Josh will do all load arms. Josh, tell me. I mean, you're familiar with. Uh, you've got a bit of build experience. Josh, tell me a little bit about level of your build experience. As far as like uh, the CAD modeling or, or no building? physical building. So anything that you have built, like uh, yeah, like. In other words, how familiar are you with, you know, like like basic geometry so you're, you're positioned well to design the loader arms? Um, I mean, fairly well. Uh, you know, I, I'm a little bit more familiar with the design for injection molding and stuff, but uh, as far as bigger machine tools, I've, um, I did a good bit of work on some large uh, injection molding machines, so actually building machines. Yeah. So yeah, that was a lot of, like, toggle design and stuff, so... Mm -hmm. It's kind of similar, you know. It's it's kind of some strange movements depending on yeah. one input yeah. and has some nonlinear outputs. Yeah, so I, I feel comfortable messing with that. That's excellent, that's excellent. Um, yeah. yeah, that's good. And next, so after the loader arm geometry, the loader arms are going to end with a with a quick connect plate for attaching implements. And for that, we'll we'll have to think about that a little bit. The immediate thought I had was to use the Bobcat standard mount so that we can interchange with other Bobcat implements. Now, because our tractor here... Yeah, that's a very popular thing. That, in other words, any implements that already exist for the Bobcat standard, which are, you know, billions of equipment out there, billions of dollars worth of equipment out there, the question is, will they fit on our tractor? Because this thing is going to weigh about 2,000 pounds when done. And uh, the width is 41 inches. And we're going by the industry standard from the Toro Dingo. It's 41 inches. So 
currently we have this R width. So is is the Bobcat quick attach? Does that fit within 41 inches? Right now, uh, to the outside of the these these shafts here, we should have 41 inches. Where are we at right now? 42.64. Not bad. Uh, we want to just poke that shaft in, maybe a little bit. Or maybe that's what we get. We get 42.6 inches. Maybe we have to live with that. But uh, we just wanted to get it as tight as possible so that we can get into tight spaces. And maybe we can, like, you know, shrink up that, you know, whatever, that half inch there so the, the idlers are right next to the body. But this is good. I mean, that's, that's a very compact machine right there. Um, Good. And um, let's see, is Ahmed here? So next is the tracks. I'll discuss the tracks just a little bit. Um, see, because I assigned the tracks to, to Ahmed. I don't know if he's here. Uh, tracks, let's just take a look at the tracks for a second. The The way to do the tracks would be to take the existing and they have to be super precise I mean just just for because we know they fit and and so forth but to do the track take the track piece which is in the part library it's the tracks unit do a path array in FreeCAD which is you draw a line and then you put a, an item an object along that path array and then you can get the whole track and you can make it tangent so if you make the track piece tangent to that shape you can just do polyline the simplest implementation of the tracks would be polyline you draw yourself a line that matches the pro the kind of like what we need so draw the in this in this picture you would draw yourself the a line that looks like the triangular tracks and then do the path array using the the individual track piece as the object that you attach to the path array and that will get your tracks. So that should be pretty straightforward now with FreeCAD uh, using the capacity of FreeCAD. Okay. Looking at the back to the spreadsheet. So we had Ahmed on that. Now, if somebody else wants to jump in there too, I mean, basically we got to complete all these blank spots here as soon as we can, and so forth. So uh, I'd like to post the event announcement for this within two weeks so we should have a good conceptual design of the, the the tractor here now the next step after we perfect this 16 horsepower version the tiny one what we want to do um, is so this is our working document here that's the frame but for a 64 horse version meaning uh, we talked about the scaling of that and we talked about this configuration here just this the large tractor would be a wider frame and two sections like this so that's what we wanted to do and therefore the next to the wide frame would be the next step where the wide frame would want to be instead of 20 inches it would want to be 40 inches or maybe a four, uh, it has to be a multiple of four so 40 does fit or it could be uh, but we have to be sh be sure that we can mount the power cubes on that. Um, I think 40 inches would be quite acceptable. And we can try that. So I'm going to add to that because that's, that's something we can pretty much pretty quickly get working on after we complete this because most of the parts for the bigger tractor are going to be applicable from this smaller one. We'd have to add a cab to the big tractor uh, where a person actually sits in there. But beyond that, a lot of similar parts. So I'm gonna add just a couple of couple of things. Insert row above that. So wide frame would be 40 inches as a start. Uh, have to mount two power cubes side to side. Two power cubes side to side and then after that we're gonna need a cab for the operator cab and seat with the uh, hydraulic valves and everything so that's that all right uh, let's move on in the meeting here 
and that is just to cover some of more ground here. So we got the power cube, we got the frame in progress. Uh, we're going to try to go with, we did a gasifier last time, so we're going to go nuts and for the October 27, 29 build, we're going to add a gasifier to this. A gasifier is a box with a hearth where you light charcoal and the charcoal goes through the air intake of the engine. So this would be the air intake valve, the butterfly valve. It'll be in front of the engine. This is something I pulled off the internet, but we're probably going to end up 3D printing this and uh, end up hopefully with the gasifier for this workshop. We would really need to have a number of people sign up for all the tasks to be accomplished. So we're, uh, we want to get this announcement up there six weeks before the event. Aiming to do that within, uh, not this weekend, but the next weekend after that, make the announcement for the the tractor. Now let's. Uh, this this is gonna rely on the CNC torch table. So this is the latest. This is from a manual. This is this is the latest iteration of the carriages for the um, the CNC torch table. We had this whole thing 3D printed. Uh, we went to smaller 3D prints so they're faster to print and metal plates on top and bottom so that this is super stiff. So this is our current implementation of the the carriage. What we're going with right now is using three-quarter inch steel pipe, Schedule 40. We found that the for the 12 foot long axis of the torch table, the torch table is large. It's it's five by ten or or six by twelve feet, and the the solid axes weigh a lot, so we wanted to go to a little lighter version so it's better. So we want to use three-quarter inch pipe. Now three-quarter inch pipe is not regular. It's not one inch. It's 1.05 inch. So we're going to modify the the bushings there to do that. But that's in progress. Uh, I think this is very solid in terms of the design. I mean, in general, the what we did when Emmanuel was here, the the motion re works relatively relatively decent. Uh, he didn't particularly like this system because he wants to go to actually to like bearings riding on rails which is a completely different design but since we want to use the universal axis as the general design pattern because we're going to scale that up to two inch shafts we want to continue the same design process as opposed to making it completely different and therefore by keeping it the same you reduce the part count and and complexity of the entire global village construction set significantly so that's a big point um, and Initial calculations for say if you have two inch shafts instead of one inch shafts here, so a much larger piece. Um, the calculations there are you get a, you get about half a thousandth deflection on a four by four CNC machine if you use two inch shafts. So the strength is there. Like some of the argument against these long shafts is that you don't have enough strength, but you can design the strength in there. You can use thicker rods. Um, you can use a smaller machine like for four by four feet. No, I think I actually did that for 2x2 two two feet working area heavy-duty CNC machine. Deflection on 2-inch shafts, if you do calculations, just basic deflection of steel for a steel tube, you get, like, I think I got like one-half or one-third of a thousandth of an inch deflection, which is quite sufficient for heavy-duty CNC precision machining. So we're going with this, continuing on this, moving forward, uh, but we got to get to this. Uh, oh yeah, but I mentioned already that we're going to do the build workshop for the CNC torch here on October 14, which is two weeks before the, the tractor workshop. So I, I'm aiming to actually get that design up there for uh, an event announcement by this weekend. Uh, let's see if I can do that. Okay, maybe, maybe uh, I'm going to try to see if Michelle can help on that. Uh, Emmanuel is actually currently designing a, a different version, so he's kind of like forking this design if you may say to basically the rail version with with metal rolling uh, metal bearings riding on rails so that's not uh, that's a fork of our design not consistent with it um, we'll see if we can get this going I'm gonna see if I can enlist uh, Michelle who actually initially designed these one inch carriages to continue work on that okay uh, this is Michelle's work on WebGL, so we're getting a whole tutorial on how to generate WebGL using FreeCAD and and uh, Blender. So this is what he's capable of doing. This is beautiful. He's doing uh, exploded part animations. The first tutorial is going to be how do you generate just the 3D 
for that you can embed and he's working with I think Jose is going to pipe in on that regarding the workflow with with GitHub of how you can store the actual images because in this WebGL documentation that you can embed so WebGL you can embed in your website but it has to the data data has to reside somewhere so actually we we're thinking about GitHub as the place where the data resides so we're developing that workflow step one is just to get excellent 3d manipulable images you can rotate them pan and zoom and the next one is actually where you can do exploded part animations where you click on things and you can explode things so we're getting that documentation up and running so hopefully everyone on the team is going to get that going okay this is saudi arabia workshop uh preparation on the 3D printer workshop, well, we don't have a scheduled date for it yet, but uh, they're working there, uh, printing out parts. Here you can see some warped parts. Here's some better parts in PLA. The, the ABS is hard to print with. It warps a lot, so uh, PLA is much better, as you see here, but that's being prototyped. And that's about all the progress we've got for this week, so um, keep going. Please do the look at the OSC ISO as task one, and second, please do the... Um, different allotted tasks here if you're not doing anything please put your name somewhere I, I'm trying to put in Alejandro there's German uh, I hope hope that's a, explained here but if you've got any questions email me what I'm expecting is that everybody would if, if uh, you know we're expecting to fill out this the spreadsheet and if you have any questions please ask uh, we've got the email thread going on email so continue so does anyone have any questions right now as far as the overall design of the the tractor and and power cube and everything else what else can i explain any questions here uh, i just have a question well i think the, you have the slide with the questions right yeah yeah, so let's take a look at some of the questions. So uh, from the back, let's go at Jose. Scrummy is not the only thing that we have dropped. We should have some control change to avoid dropping good practices and procedures, especially because new people are coming in. Some process control flow is good. Well, agreed, but um, the effort to do that just hasn't happened. So how do we address yeah. that? Any solutions, um, Jose? Yeah, what I do in our team is just take notes. Uh, we moderate. Uh, well, stop. Uh, now everything is being documented on video and if you want to have a follow-up you would have to see all the videos and that's uh, yeah. kind of uh, for long term perhaps I think yeah okay well, who wants to be a note taker? We we need a note note taker for the meeting. Someone who can do a one page summary of the main points of the meeting. Yeah, yeah my point is uh, that if if uh, we rotate on that, you make sure that the whole team uh, is on top of what's going on. You okay. Know? That's that's a, a practice I made in our team, and I think it's it's a, it's a good idea. It works fine. Yeah, we got to so, do it. So. So for next week, who wants to be the note taker? Well, I can make it. Yeah. Fine. Okay. And, uh, and the other thing was, uh, um, yeah, I think that was, uh, yeah. Well, that's a good idea. We just need the bodies to do it uh, and people to continue with the meetings and so forth so that's that's good that's that definitely would help because yeah I mean to watch the video is a little long but if it's an hour what I do typically is I put it on YouTube on double speed so it only takes you a half hour and you can even on double speed you can still go through like uh, skipping through it to relevant parts you can kind of get a meaning of a the meaning of a meeting pretty quickly if you review if you kind of review the the YouTube effectively okay yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, well, we have Jose for next time, so we'll keep you to task on that for next time. It's question two. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Also, I think you should ask the rest of the team if they agree. It's something that works for me, but perhaps for others. Well, what do other, any other comments from people who are on right now? What What is the deal? How to best continue and, and you know follow up? Like, if people miss a meeting, how to do it? How do we get the most out of these meetings? I mean, definitely the meetings could, could improve. I'm kind of 
know, pretty much spearheading the meetings. But we need some help on that. Like, you know, like Joseph, if you could do some some stuff like what? Like, I mean, preparing kind of like being really on top of what everyone is doing, you know, and clarity on role allocation that that would help. And it's I know that we're skipping around a bit. So things are dynamic. It's a dynamic, agile process. Um, any other thoughts on the topic? Yeah, I think the notes are a good idea. Yep. Um, I think that the scrummy and things like that dropped before because, I don't know, I guess there's been a lot of changes, you know, in different websites and different tools used to do different logging. And mm -hmm. I think some people didn't like having to update all the different pages. Yeah. Which, uh, as I noted on the above questions there, thinking that the, the scrummy i really like that board too it's one like page yeah. that shows it can show everything what everybody's doing but i was thinking too we've got all this new web stuff there and i don't know how the new logging features i'm sure that's being uh developed further as far as the log and the time and all that um but if it can be you know advanced more maybe it can be uh made you know similar it could have more features from the logs and so on with that web development you talking you know, about, about the, the about that just uh, as a comment i'm using uh, almost every day uh, github and uh, you have uh, analytics of everything that is happening per week per day uh -huh. uh, intensity everything. so i think it's something nice to just to check yeah, because it basically has all the functionality. So, I mean, we have to, uh, right? I mean, if you're really familiar with, it, I mean, we basically need somebody to teach all of us, all the rest of us, how to do that effectively. I don't. It's really, yeah. yeah. It's really, uh, you, you have to try it, man. It's really, you. I don't. I, I think now it's late to share a screen for you, but uh, it, it has everything. You know, you, you see who is contributing, how much is contributing, uh, you see the dynamics that you're showing just now with, uh, with the analytics that's, that's done in GitHub. All the kind of tasks are done in GitHub plus control version of what you're doing. So, uh, I don't know. I, I think it's a, it's a big step, but I, I would consider it before moving forward in making your custom solution, you know? Right. And... Um so what about one specific question you know how we have the version history and we can download any back version how do you do that in github is that as easy as the wiki for example because we're putting all the files on the wiki right now and it's nice uh -huh. because you have comments and you you can download the old old versions readily is that as easy in github yeah uh, perhaps, perhaps that's something we should uh, see if you can actually download old versions I don't think you can you can do it as easily as, as the wiki. Yeah, I mean but that's a, yeah. I, yeah, we should check out that. But the work the workflow itself, you can see all the development of the workflow, the branches, the versioning, uh, all the genealogic development of the of the thing. But you're right. Uh, perhaps it's not uh, useful in that sense. I don't know. It's something. It's something strategic. You know, it's it's not something you just decide. Right. Something. Yeah, if a clear workflow emerges that that people use on GitHub, then then we can try it. I mean, one one other thing is the learning curve of GitHub as well that has to be considered, because uh, yeah, we do know that that Google Docs and and wikis work. We that's proven, so that's yeah. what we've been doing so far. I think we'll have to continue and see how yeah, how it goes. I think, I think you should check it, Marshall, because you have a lot of us. You are by far the most experienced. Yeah. So I think you have intuition to decide on that, but uh, perhaps it's just nice to run a test uh, uh, without dropping the wiki or anything. Just keep the process and make a yeah. test with one small project and see how it right. works. You know? Yeah, I mean, so far it hasn't worked because I think Roberto tried setting up one project on GitHub, or I think you did. I mean, we kind of tried it, but people didn't. It didn't stick. You know, we kind of. No, I think that we didn't. Uh, we didn't uh, decide on, on it. We. Uh, I think Roberto downloaded the GitHub 
Dick Craig impression. Uh, I don't know, man. I mean, it's something to to work as that and see how far we go. And find yeah. Um, right. I mean, there. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen a, a case like a compelling case, like just on a virtue of the version history part, which I just asked right now, which which GitHub doesn't have a good solution. I mean, that that I think is pretty important in our workflow. Right. Um, I don't know. Hey, can I can I jump in? Yeah. Uh, this is John. Yeah. Um, so I know that uh, when I was at Lulzbot, they actually were just working on transitioning over to using Git. Um, yeah. As a version control system for all their hardware. You just visit them, or you work there, or? Yeah, when, when I was working there, they were working on um, transitioning over to using Git. And, you know, it's, as far as I understand, I'm, I'm not an expert in it, but I know that you can go back and find the previous commit and then pull that part out. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's actually, you know, there's some fairly easy uh, GUIs to use Git as well. So it's, it's not like you have to, you know, be typing everything in on your command line. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think, I mean, that's what it's built for is version right no it's true it's true um yeah, that's what the open source software develop, development yeah uses. Yeah. It's, yeah yeah i mean it's hey guys can you hear me yeah this is Lex. Yeah. yeah i have i have a lot of experience with github so i can answer uh, questions or or um i don't know what what so you're asking if if you can go back in version uh the answer is yes both for the wiki and you know if you have the github wiki and then also for obviously any files that are committed mm -hmm. yeah. yeah okay yeah i mean maybe we just gotta go try it on us on a certain certain t test case to see how it works um and then take the hit of uh, just a little bit of learning curve on that and of course it, it will have a little learning curve but it will make some things more efficient i'm wondering if if it's worthwhile to I mean, we always like multiple solutions and then maybe people who really gravitate to that can definitely use it but what about the people that are the total beginners are they going to be left behind that's one of my concerns with that it's, 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 easier, than, it's easier than the wiki man. the way it is set up now and it also has a wiki mm -hmm. and it, uh, it's much more of control because for instance now in the, in the wiki of the of OC to find the documentation very difficult, but in, in GitHub you have specific repositories per project, you know, that changes a lot the, the, the yeah, it, it makes it very easy, so it's, it's nice just to, to spend a little bit of time on that, just one hour a week, dedicated yeah. only to that, and uh, show you how it works, and how you can see how, how actually the analytics, and okay. have uh, many, many interesting uh, problems solved, you know, many, many yeah. Yeah. Okay. One, th okay. one thing I'll add about the uh, uh, splitting things across different repositories is that uh, almost uh, every case I've seen of big projects, they usually have one repository that they uh, use as like the official or the main repository. Yeah. And they turn off issues and wiki and all the other ones because uh, if you have if you support issues in all of the projects or wikis in all the projects, then uh, it's going to get uh, disorganized and, and you won't be able to aggregate things. So if, if we go down using GitHub for tracking all uh, OSC work, it's better to have one, you know, choose one uh, repo to do that, and then all issues should go there, and all the management should be in that one repo. You can still have lots of other repos for, for source code, but uh, it should be sort of standard that any issues that people submit or tasks, those all go in one, in one repo. Yeah, okay. And we can, I think we can make both, re reconcile both of them as... Um, when we finally have yeah yeah i mean i don't think both are exclusive i think we can do both and of course we're not going to just trash the wiki uh so i think yeah we should get ready for yeah we should just experiment a little more with how how exactly to integrate that seamlessly into our workflow yeah um yeah okay. it seems to me like the as managing parts uh, I, I like that uh being more toward github and then having sort of oh. like information, things that you know are very text based, where you're trying to search for, you know, how do I do this type of process? That's really, really good for a wiki. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely, yeah, definitely we gotta maybe upgrade our skill set here. 
and promote that. But look at that screen of mine there. This is uh, Michelle's work, the exploded ramps board, man. This is Michelle, amazing work, man. <laughs> so I look forward to all of us learning how to do this. This is um, most amazing. Uh, thanks a lot. No, we'll, we'll continue on that. Um, I gotta actually get going because we're talking. I'm talking to Salam about the the computer vision on a tractor. So I need to do that. So we need to get off the call here. But please continue on the work. Let's see the last question that we'll um, we'll entertain here. So so how will the logs be handled? New logs and time. We have a um, and they are in separate database and currently not editable. What about searchable? Also, direct wiki links don't work, can't be added. Also, much like time is aggregated, it might be useful to create a page with recent log updates for all users. Kind of real-time scrummy log board. I think Lex could handle some of those those issues, and I think... Well, uh, the last one is already solved. I mean, the last one is if you just go to oacdev.org, you see uh, everyone together. Yeah. And then as far as the search, I mean, I can definitely add search, but uh, to be able to search, to do one search info box that searches both the wiki and the log, that'll be a little bit trickier to do. Um, and then as far as being able to edit them, uh, that's once you can log in, because that, that currently exists, you can't edit them, but you have to be able to log in to edit them, uh, and, and that's not uh, possible yet. Yeah. As soon as the, that part is working, then you'll be able to edit your own entries, at least for a week back, or I don't know, we can yeah. figure out exactly how far back to let people edit stuff. Yeah, and oh yeah, who did the open PLM quote? I open PLM comment, who said that? Steven. Well, if you can tell us I was just looking at that yesterday and if it's in a good state of development, we should absolutely do it because that they from what I've heard just on the web, that looks like they have like automatic bill of material generation. I like come of some of the critical workflows that we need to go from CAD to actual production. So we need to look at that. I don't know enough about it. So if anyone knows more about OpenPLM, Steven, let's let's talk about it. Um, but yeah, we got to look into that. And, and the thing there is we need to find somebody who knows about that well. To um, I just don't know the answer right now. We need to find somebody from the OpenPLM to see if um, basically what the status is. The best thing is to just check in with some of their leadership to, or, or forums or whatever to see what, what exactly is possible right now. And also depends on the state of development of that project. If it's a well-developed project, if it's got good development going on, yes, it's worth it. But if it's going to be a stalled project, it's not worth investing in that. So we need to find out some of those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, I need to get going right now um, for the next meeting. But thanks a lot. We'll continue. So continue on a CAD, continue on the other stuff. And we'll keep going. And next time we're going to have a note taker. And please update your logs in the new interface as well as download the OSE ISO. Put your comments if it works for you. It doesn't take a long time. Just download it and make the USB. It takes an hour or two. Thanks a lot, everyone. So stop.